Good morning, family. Welcome back to uh, church this seventh Sunday after Easter. We're happy to be together with you again on this, uh, what I hope will be a beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, we'll begin uh, this morning with the call to worship. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning you created us in your image and planted us in a well-watered garden. In the desert, you promised pools of water for the parched, and you gave us water from the rock. When we did not know the way, you sent the good shepherd to lead us to still waters. At the cross, you watered us from Jesus' wounded side. And on this day, you shower us again with the water of life. We praise you for your salvation through the waters of baptism and for all water everywhere. Bathe us in your forgiveness, grace, and love. Satisfy the thirsty and give us the only life, give us the life only you can give. To you be honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We pray. O God of glory, your son Jesus Christ suffered for us and ascended to your right hand. Unite us with Christ and each other in suffering and in joy, that all the world may be drawn into your bountiful presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The reading today comes from 1 Peter, chapter 4, 12 through 14, and chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. 
Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you are sharing Christ's suffering, so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves, keep alert, like a roaring lion. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around, looking for something to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. The next reading is from the book of John, chapter 17, verses 1 through 11. After Jesus had spoken these words to his disciples, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf, I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. This is the word of the Lord. Well, hi there, everybody. It's time for our kids' message this morning, and uh, normally I would have you all come up here um, and do the kids' message, but I hope that you enjoy this in your homes uh, as well. Um, so I wanted to just take a minute today and talk about a line from our reading that Pastor Dan's going to use for his sermon today, and uh, it, that line from that reading, it says, cast all your anxieties on God. Cast all your anxieties on God. So what is an anxiety? Well, have you ever felt nervous before? Have you ever felt like butterflies in your stomach about something that you've had to go and do or something that you know is going to happen or something that's coming up uh, in the future? Well, that is kind of what anxiety is, where we just don't feel right about something that's happening or we feel nervous or uh, we just feel not ourselves about something going on. Um, but you know what? In our reading today, God tells us that when we feel those things, when we have something that we're nervous about or uh, something goes on in our lives that we don't really like and we don't feel good about, we can give all of that to God. Hmm. How would we do that, though? Well, I think a good way that we can do that is by lifting those things to God in prayer. We can, whatever's going on in our lives, we can talk to God about what's happening. Did you know that you can actually talk to God? You can pray to God and talk to God whenever you want, wherever you want, about whatever you want to talk about. So if there's something going on in your lives, we should take a lesson from our reading today and uh, really talk to God about that. Pray to God about whatever's going on that's making you feel not great, that's making you feel anxious. And God will take those things from us, and uh, he will offer us peace and comfort during those times. All right? Well, thanks for watching, everybody. Let's pray. We're going to do one, two, three, clap, and then I'll pray, and you repeat after me. Sound good? All right. One, two, three. Dear God, thank you so much that you take all of our anxieties from us. You promise us that when something is going on in our lives, we can give that all to you. 
Help us to come to you in prayer and receive the peace that you offer us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thanks everybody. May the words of my heart and the meditations of my mouth be acceptable to you, Jesus Christ, my Savior and Redeemer. Amen. Family, today is the seventh and final Sunday in the season of Easter. And when this pandemic forced us to pause our in-person worship, I honestly believed that we would be back together by Easter morning, that we would be worshiping here on Easter morning, uh, and that things would be just like they were before. But here we are seven weeks later, and um, we're still worshiping through this camera. Um, we're at least several weeks from opening again for corporate worship, and it's becoming quite obvious that things are just not going to be like they were before. Um, things are not going ever going to go back to what we would consider normal. Uh, there is going to be a new normal. Life together is going to be different. It's going to be better <clears throat> or it's going to be worse. The only thing we know for sure is it's not going to be the same. The good news is we are the ones who will determine whether it's better or worse. And it's not going to be so much the decisions that we make that determine that because, look, we're going to make some good decisions and we're going to make some bad decisions. We'll make them for the right reasons, um, but they won't work out because we're facing things that none of us have had to face before. So there will be some decisions that work out and some that don't. That's not going to be the thing that determines whether or not our new normal is better or worse than our old normal. What's going to determine that is how much we love each other and through that, how much we love God. If we're together through all this, if we're gracious with each other and forgiving and patient, our new normal will almost certainly be better than our old normal. But if we're uh, impatient, and angry and insist on getting our own way and uh, just judgmental with how every decision that gets made, well, then things probably um, won't be getting any better. Things will probably be worse. But whether or not things, our new normal is better is going to depend on our love, that, the love that we have for God and how we show that in our love for one another. So as we're planning and waiting and looking forward to being together again, I would just like us all to be thinking about that because it's going to be here soon enough. Now, as this is the last Sunday in the Easter season, I thought it would be a good time to reflect on what all of that means. But first, it also means this is my last opportunity for a little while to say he is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hopefully I caught a few of you uh, uh, off, off target a little bit, and um, maybe uh, hopefully nobody spilled their coffee. Now, in our histor historical liturgy, uh, we used to say during the service, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. And my question for today is, so what? I mean, it's great that Jesus was willing to sacrifice his life for ours. It's even better that he was raised from the dead, and even better that he will come back again someday. All that stuff is great. But we have problems now. The dying and rising happened almost 2,000 years years ago, and the coming back might be another 2,000 years. Who knows? It might be before I get done reading this sermon, but it might be another 2,000 years in the future. So does his death and resurrection matter for us in our lives at this moment right now? 
I believe it does. I believe it matters very much, especially in times like we're going through right now. Our reading from 1 Peter tells us that we should not be surprised by hard times. In fact, we should be glad and shout for joy because in difficult circumstances, in suffering, we share in the suffering of Jesus. And when we do that, the glory of God is revealed. This stands in opposition to the way that we far too often think uh, and the way that the world and much of the church thinks about God's glory. Far too many Christians believe and far too many churches teach that God's glory is best seen in what we would call blessings. When we have a financial windfall, if we gain political power, when our favorite team wins the Super Bowl or the Stanley Cup, when our children are successful. Basically, whenever our lives are going along swimmingly, then God's glory is obvious. This notion is best expressed in the idea that we get what we deserve. And if things are going better for us, then they're going for other people, then it's because we deserve it. It's because God loves us more. He likes us better. He loves us more. And so he's taking care of us better, and we deserve it. This is called the theology of glory, the idea that God is best revealed in victory and success and wealth and beauty. Lutherans do not, at least in our confessions and in our doctrine, believe in a theology of glory. Lutherans believe in the theology of the cross, which says that God's glory is best exemplified in the cross. It's best exemplified in sacrifice and suffering. And our reading from 1 Peter describes this very well. It says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Uh, but rejoice insofar as you are sharing Christ's sufferings so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. But we don't like ordeals. We don't like being tested, and we could do, frankly, without sharing in Christ's suffering. So we find a theology of glory much more attractive. The question is, do we decide to live our lives based on philosophies that sound the easiest or the most fun, or do we live our lives based on what an all-knowing and unconditionally loving God tells us is best for our souls? Do we spend our time chasing glory or do we rejoice in all circumstances, good and bad, knowing that God is with us and in us regardless of our circumstances? Even if we're not crazy about it, we know what the right answer is to that question. So how do we do it? How do we live a life that rejoices in suffering and trials and hard times? Again, 1 Peter has the answer for us. It says that we should endeavor to live lives of humility, and, and when we have problems, and when we have anxieties, when we're going through trials and sufferings, we should hand those things over to God, because God cares for us, God will be with us, and God will bring us through those times, and in those situations, God will be glorified not just in our successes, not just in our victories, but in our pain and our suffering and our failure. And Easter means that just as God's glory is most clearly seen in the death and resurrection of Jesus, we are joined to God through them. Just as Jesus was raised from dead, from dead to eternal life, so shall we be. 1 Peter again says, as you have suffered for a little while, the grace of God who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. Family pain and suffering, trials and temptations, um, 
fear and frustration, all of these things are temporary, but you are eternal. The world's scorn and hatred is temporary, but God's love is eternal. The suffering and pain that we're going through and the fear and all those things we're going through with this pandemic, the frustration that we're, we're, we're going through, that is temporary. We have to learn from those things. We have to learn from them the best we can and learn that we need to be smart, but we don't need to be afraid. And this lesson in 1 Peter tells us that in all those things, God will be glorified. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Amen. come together in a time of confession and absolution. 
Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Family, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We take a few moments for silence and self-reflection. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Family, Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. We remember especially this day Chelsea, Marlene, Danielle, Acacia, and Kurt. O oh God, call your people to be one as you are one. Unite your church in the truth of your gospel, the love of our neighbor, and the call to proclaim your reign to all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Breathe life into your creation. Guide your people as we explore the mercies of the universe. We pray for the work of scientists and doctors who are working on a vaccine for the coronavirus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Make your justice known among the nations of the earth. Protect the vulnerable, especially those infected with COVID-19. Redirect those who use violence and, and greed as weapons. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Come to the aid of your children. We pray for those engulfed in grief, those without supportive families, and for all who are isolated, powerless, or afraid, that all may rest their anxieties in your care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give courage to all who embark on new ventures. We especially remember this day those who risk their lives to serve in our armed forces. Grant safety to those serving at home or abroad and assure them of your never failing strength. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We take some time now and lift our own personal prayers to God. Raise all your saints to eternal life. Until that day, we give you thanks for the faithful examples of those who have listened to your voice and now rest in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Now, family, may the one who brought forth Jesus from the dead raise you to new life, fill you with hope, and turn your mourning into dancing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Christ is risen, just as he said. Go in peace and share the good news. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.